In this tutorial, we're going to focus on one thing alone, and that is the uses of electromagnetic radiation. So the one and only aim is describe some uses of the different types of EM radiation. Whether you're higher or foundation, you will need to know this. At a slightly more sophisticated level, you should be able to describe how different frequencies of radiation affect matter in different ways. So to help you understand that, you might have seen in certain cartoons that you sometimes get an opera singer singing very high, very loud, and glass and windows shatter around them. This, believe it or not, is entirely possible, and actually has been accomplished. You see, matter is made of molecules or particles, atoms, and all of these particles vibrate slightly. They have their own frequency. If the frequency of a sound wave matches the frequency of the particles that make up that matter, then you cause those particles to vibrate more and more. So a high-pitched sound, in other words, a high-frequency sound, can cause particles and glass to vibrate until the glass shatters. This relationship between the frequency of a wave and vibrations in particles is essential to understanding why different frequencies of electromagnetic radiation have specific effects on matter. So just as a quick recap, remember, the lowest frequency waves with the longest wavelength are radio waves, then going along we have microwaves, infrared, visible, UV, x-rays and gamma rays with the highest frequency and shortest wavelength. One thing to add, it's important to know for this specific topic that every band of electromagnetic radiation has a range of frequencies. It's not just like you have one frequency for radio waves, one for microwaves. They in themselves have their own spectrum just like visible light, which has red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. All the different colours of light have their own frequency. So let's get right to it. First we have radio waves with the longest wavelength. Some radio waves can actually have a wavelength between 1 to 10 kilometres long. That's the distance between one crest of a wave and the crest of the next wave. Because of this, they can be transmitted over long distances because they diffract around curved surfaces. So if you imagine a normal wave travels, once it hits a sort of bump, it might be absorbed by that bump and that's the end of its journey. But radio waves, because of their long wavelength, do this. As they emit, imagine this is one crest to another, starts to arc outwards as they encounter a bump. And it happens again. This arcing is called diffraction. You may notice this late at night when you're looking at a street lamp and you squint your eyes slightly. You'll notice the light arcs outwards. This is what happens when light travels through a narrow gap. It diffracts and we perceive that as this light arcing outwards. So we can use radio waves or long wave radio waves for AM radio. That's long distance radio. Essentially radio waves are used for communication. Shorter wave radio waves between 10 meters and 100 meters travel long distances but for a different reason. They can be reflected by an electrically charged layer of our atmosphere called the ionosphere. You see at this point high up in our atmosphere we have atoms which are being ionized by UV radiation and other ionizing radiations. These radiations are literally kicking off electrons on the outer shell of atoms. This leaves the atoms and molecules charged and we have this ionized layer of gases. So some radio waves can actually travel by being reflected by the ionosphere. This also makes long distance communication possible. Very short radio waves from about 10 centimeters to 10 meters in wavelength require the transmitter to be in direct sight. Examples of this are TV and FM radio. I was brought up in London. I remember whenever we went on long distance car journeys, I noticed that capital radio station FM would basically cut out when we started leaving London, but other radio stations, AM radio, would still be with us. And that's because FM radio, the frequency at which it's broadcast, can only travel certain distances and it needs a direct line of sight to the transmitter. It can't do the whole diffracting round hills thing. Next up we have microwaves, which can also be used for communication. In fact, you could easily argue that microwaves are part of the radio wave spectrum. Some wavelengths are used for satellite communication, for example for satellite TV, and mobile phone communication, which I'm sure you're all very aware of and love and depend on relentlessly. So what's special about microwaves is that they can pass through the watery atmosphere and reach satellites which transmit the signal back. So here you can see the watery layer of the atmosphere and microwaves can actually penetrate this and reach satellites which transfer the wave back to Earth. 
So if this person is ringing on their mobile phone to let's say someone who's quite close by, even if they're right next to you, what can happen is the signal actually leaves our atmosphere and then gets transmitted from space back to the person with the other mobile phone. Quite bonkers when you think about it. But microwaves can also be used for cooking and microwave ovens emit different frequencies of radiation that are absorbed by water molecules in food. And that causes the food to heat up. So let's say I'm microwaving a potato. Obviously, I'd have the door shut for this normally. What microwaves do is because of their specific frequency and wavelength, they will penetrate a few centimetres in to the potato or whatever you've got in there. And as the water molecules heat up, they cause other molecules to heat up through conduction. That's when particles get excited and start vibrating and knocking to other particles, causing them to vibrate as well. But also you can get this sort of circular patterns of heat, which we call convection currents. So the potato will get cooked through conduction and convection after the microwave penetrates and heats up the water molecules. Now I've read that microwaves have a fairly long wavelength, so in fact uh, what can happen is microwaves cook at certain points, hot spots. That's why microwaves rotate the food so those hot spots don't stick in one point of the food. You can see this if you put bread in a microwave and heat it up really full blast for about 6 seconds, 7 seconds, you'll see a brown dark spot at one point in the bread but the rest is uncooked. For this reason, I've been told that you can actually put ants in a microwave and they can just happily avoid the hot spots and survive. But don't put anything big in there like a cat, it will definitely die. Also, don't put metals in there. Metals will end up conducting electricity and sparking and that can cause a fire. Next up, we have the very important infrared radiation part of the spectrum. So, also known as heat radiation, it's emitted by hot objects. The hotter the object, the more infrared radiation is emitted. Infrared sensors can be used to detect heat signatures and this has some interesting consequences. For example, fraudsters can use infrared technology to see where your heat signatures lie on a keypad after using a bank ATM. So everyone has a four digit code and let's say they press it in. That is not my code by the way. These specific keys will be hotter than the rest so you can use an infrared camera to detect where the heat signatures lie and you can guess the code and get their money providing you've stolen their card first. So what I tend to do after withdrawing money is I just mark every single one with my finger to make sure that there's no easy to read signature pattern. Also, very popular in video games and films, we can use it for night vision equipment. So you can see this is a dark room, uh, or you can imagine it's a dark room, and you can see the heat source where it's hottest, it's glowing brighter. We can use it for security cameras. We can use infrared radiation for toasters, which I'll show you in a second, Bluetooth and remote controls, which I've already shown you if you remember this clip here. That's infrared. And if you enjoy cable TV, you can thank infrared radiation for that. We use optical fibers to transmit pulses of infrared radiation across very long distances underground. The waves are internally reflected by the cable until they reach the end. So check this video out. Basically, I've got a laser pen which represents my infrared source, even though it's not infrared really, um, and I've got a loop piece of plastic. And what you might expect is the light to shine through, but it doesn't. It comes out the end here. And that's because it's being internally reflected because of the angle it enters. So what's happening is instead of the light just doing that, as you might expect, it, because the angle it comes in, it just bounces inside. It can never leave. So it ends up internally reflecting until it reaches the other side of the cable. But higher frequencies of infrared radiation can cause skin burns, and we can use them to cook food as well in ovens or toasters. So if you remember I said that different frequencies affect matter in different ways, if the frequency matches how those particles naturally vibrate, then you'll have this effect on them. Well, this is why different frequency infrared can do different things. It's very commonly tested on point that you know that higher frequency infrared can be used for cooking because it has a higher frequency, but lower frequency can be used for communication. Next up we have visible light and we can split visible light into its seven different wavelengths or frequencies if you like using a prism. A prism does this purely because it has unparalleled sides, just like a raindrop. If you think of a raindrop, it's basically this shape but with a curved bit at the end. This is why prisms and raindrops create this rainbow, this spectrum of visible light. You will need to know the colours, believe it or not, especially if you're foundation. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Roy, ger, biv. That's how I remember it. And obviously, our command of visible light has allowed us to capture historical events or just events on a day-to-day -day basis using photography. 
So you probably know that cameras capture images on film at the back of the camera, but in front of the film you have a part of the camera called the shutter. Now this basically raises and lowers to block and allow light through to interact with the film. If the camera's shutter goes up and down very quickly, we have a short exposure film. This means that we've captured a snapshot of light over a very short space of time. This allows us to take still snapshots of very quickly moving things like water waves. And you can see it doesn't look like they're blurred at all. We can capture every individual particle as if we've frozen time. But we can also do long exposure photographs where we keep the shutter open for longer. What this means is we give more time for the light source to basically emit light and for more light to be captured onto the film. Now, if that object is moving, then light will be coming from different directions, so you'll trace the object's movement on film, and that's what's happening here. This is a long exposure photograph with the shutter being open for a longer time. This is just a road with cars moving along it. Pretty cool visual effect. So now we get to the first of the three ionizing radiations, the ionizing part of the electromagnetic spectrum, in other words, those which can cause cancer. These have the highest frequency. The first up is ultraviolet radiation. You may have noticed that certain objects are fluorescent, like for example the pigment that make up part of this fish's scales. What these can do, fluorescent objects can absorb UV and then emit it as visible light so you can see it. These beads are the coolest thing ever, check it out. Basically I'm holding a UV source up to them and they're absorbing that light. And then finally I'll remove my hand once they've absorbed enough and they re-emit it as visible light. In fact, they re-emit it as different parts of the visible spectrum. That's why they're different colours. Amazing. We can also use UV to detect fraudulent banknotes or bank cards. And we can also use them in security pens to identify property. So we can use UV ink where we basically write something down. We can't see it, but if we shine a UV light on it, then you can see it. This is a good way to tag bikes, for example, so you can see who their owner is and you can detect if a bike has been stolen or not. So here on a £20 note, you can see the UV tag. This is very hard to copy if you're a fraudster. So you can check how genuine a note is by holding a UV source to it, and if it glows this sort of 20 or 10 or 5, depending on the note, then you know it's a genuine note. Similarly, Visa cards have this fluorescent V, and Master cards have an M, which is only detectable once you shine a UV source on them. Just so you know, this isn't truly UV. This is somewhere in between the violet part of the spectrum and UV part of the spectrum. That's why we can still see it but it's high frequency enough for it to have this effect. But UV is ionizing, it can cause skin cancer, it is dangerous. So uh, some lamps, for example, fluorescent lamps, have a phosphor coating. You may have noticed this, a white coating that coats the bulb's glass, and that absorbs the harmful UV radiation, so we just get harmless light coming out. And we can also use UV to uh, sterilize water to kill harmful viruses and bacteria in water. Because it's ionizing, it can do that, it can kill living cells. X-rays are the next type of ionizing radiation, more ionizing than UV, more dangerous to us. You can actually take X-ray photographs to check for bone abnormalities, to check, for example, the bone's not fractured or broken, or even dental surgery, so, for example, for wisdom teeth that might not be growing properly. Now, I kid you not, when I was a kid, they used to use X-rays to measure your shoe size. You literally went into a shoe shop and you'd stick your foot underneath an x-ray emitter, and they'd basically fire x-rays at your feet to get a picture of your foot inside the shoe, so you can see how far your bone comes up to the shoe. It just really shows our ignorance through time. But I survived it because the dose is always very low. So let's say you're getting a chest x-ray. The radiographer would stand behind a lead screen to make sure that they're not being affected by x-rays. Obviously, they work with them on a day-to-day -day basis, so even though the dose is low, you don't want constant exposure to x-rays. So always behind a lead screen. X-rays are then emitted at the chest, and what happens as they go through, denser materials such as bone absorb the x-rays, whereas less dense material like flesh allow x-rays to pass through. Where the x-rays contact the film on the screen, the film darkens. So what you're really getting is a picture of the shadow of the bone, although the shadow here is light, not dark. Airport security can also use low-level x-rays to scan luggage and look for suspicious objects. This is just an x-ray picture of a, a TV. 
But you can imagine much the same a bomb might work. You could see um, circuitry and sort of metal components. Also metal objects like knives and so on, which basically are dense materials, so x-rays get absorbed by them and you can again get the shadow of the metal dense objects. So finally, the most ionizing of the radiations is gamma radiation. High doses can kill all living cells, and for that reason, they can be used to treat cancer as well as cause cancer. You see, gamma rays can mutate DNA and cause cancer, but given a high enough dose, it can kill all sorts of living cells. So some people with cancer get radiotherapy where gamma rays are targeted at specific regions in the body to kill all cells in that region. Now, killing healthy cells will make you feel unwell, but if it kills the cancerous cells as well, then ultimately you'll be cured. Gamma radiation was probably made famous to young people due to the Hulk, which was a product of absorbing too much gamma radiation. But while that sounds really cool, it wouldn't happen, you would die. But as well as treating cancers, gamma can be used to diagnose cancers. What you do is inject a radioactive isotope, that's just a radioactive version of an element, into the body and using gamma cameras to detect the radiation to produce an image. So you'd literally inject a radioactive source. The gamma being very penetrating would easily escape the body because it's a tiny wavelength, very short and it could form an image on the screen. So imagine this is someone's thyroid gland, you can see that there's a bump here, perhaps that's a tumorous growth. We can also use uh, gamma radiation to sterilize surgical equipment and food without cooking it. So obviously you have to ensure that surgical equipment is completely sterile, no bacteria, anything that can cause illness, because you're invading bodies and basically you could easily cause infection if you didn't sterilize the equipment. So gamma very quickly obliterates all sorts of bacteria and harmful things on surgical equipment. Same for food, we don't want to eat lots of bacteria and the advantage of using gamma radiation to kill bacteria and so on on food is it doesn't cook it, it doesn't actually heat it up, it just kills the bacteria. But all that is too much to remember, just look at the summary. Radio waves can be used for TV and radio communication, microwaves for mobile phone communication, satellite communication and cooking through microwave ovens. Infrared can be used for Bluetooth communication, remote controls, thermal imaging, optical fiber communication, and cooking through toasters and ovens. Visible light can be used for photography. UV can be used for tanning and tanning salons, but you do risk skin cancer at high doses. It can be used to sterilize water, fluorescent materials, um, used as security tags, and used for banknote fraud. X-rays can be used to take pictures of bones and also used in airport security. And finally, gamma can be used to treat cancer, diagnose cancer, and sterilize food and surgical equipment. And that's how you describe some of the uses of the different types of EM radiation. Done.